This week, the West springs to life, and the East, well, the East. First thing this week is Major General Ulysses S. Grant. He's becoming increasingly angry at the illegal cotton trade taking place within the boundaries of his command. And he has one group to blame, the Jews. On the 5th, he tells Major General William T. Sherman, again, Grant and anti-Semitism is a touchy subject, and I'm not going to get into that. No. So the next thing, in consequence of the total disregard and evasion of orders by the Jews, my policy is to exclude them so far as practicable from the department. On the 7th, Confederate cavalryman John Hunt Morgan surrounds and captures 2,000 Union soldiers in Huntsville. And that's not the only engagement on the 7th, as we turn to Prairie Grove, Arkansas. The battle for Arkansas has been raging for some time now, ever since the Battle of Pea Ridge earlier this year. The Union Army of the Frontier, of some 10,000 men strong, has been bringing the breakaway state back under federal control. Commander of this force is Major General John Schofield, with the division of command going to three divisions, one of Brigadier General James Blunt, the second Colonel Daniel Houston Jr., and the third being Brigadier General Francis J. Heron. Closing the Army of the Frontier is the Trans-Mississippi Army for around 12,000 men under Major General Thomas C. Hindman. Hindman's command, which is also further divided into three divisions, goes Brigadier General Francis A. Shoup, Brigadier General Daniel M. Frost, and Brigadier General John S. Marmaduke. Marmaduke being a commander of a cavalry division. After the Union secured Cane Hill, the Confederacy has been on the back foot. This won't do for the rebels, and therefore Hinman concocts a plan to go on the assault and overtake the Union and throw them back to Missouri. The problem for General Hinman is that elsewhere in the West is under threat, namely Vicksburg. He was very able to keep his men in Arkansas after being told to send them to the Mississippi. He has no hope of reinforcements do or die with what he has. The Union is also on shaky ground. It's had a shake up of command. Usually, Brigadier General James Toden is in control of the 2nd Division, but he is in St. Louis as a witness to a court-martial. And General Schofield is too sick to lead the Army, leaving it to Brigadier General James Blunt of the 1st Division. The Confederates take advantage of this situation. Finn plans to push back the enemy of Cove Creek Road, giving him breathing room. He wants to move towards Newburgh. On the 6th, skirmishing between Colonel Joseph O. Shelby's brigade and the 2nd Kansas Volunteer Cavalry. On the 7th, Confederate General Marmaduke ambushes two Missouri regiments with his 2,000 cavalry. The Union is quickly routed. The 1st Union Arkansas Cavalry soon shows up. They're disorganized by their retreating comrades and then slammed by a charge from Marmaduke. After this early victory, the rebels pursued all the way until near the Illinois River, and Union General and Union General Heron's column, the second and third divisions, made the Confederates freeze and fall back against the superior numbers without even so much of a fight. Marmaduke is just the forward guard. Confederate General Frost has his 6,300 men division right behind, but he's instead moved to a more defensive position. When over 3,000 men under General Shoup arrive, they assume the high ground at Perry Grove. This is not what Hinman wanted, but it's too late for him to do anything elsewhere. Brigadier General James Blunt of the Union has a third of the Union army. Before him is Confederate cavalry, most likely a bluff. At least he hopes. He sends forward cavalry and two housers under Colonel Judson towards the main Confederate body elsewhere. His division marches under the help of cavalry along the long route, using Ridge Road and Vinnie Groove Road. But it's too late, as cans are heard in the distance. The Confederate line is stretched along Prairie Grove. The line was made up of Shoup and Marmaduke, strong men but weak artillery. General Heron and Colonel Houston of the Union deploy their cannons and begin a bombardment. The Confederates try to respond, but they are outranged. The Union heavy guns cut into the neatly formed rank. The rebels sit on the high ground, but only a few continue to stand. Heron is happy with the result so far. He has no idea who he is facing. Probably just the advance guard of the main Confederate body. He has two brigades to advance, Colonel Orms and Lieutenant Colonel Bertrams. These two men at first do well, overtaking Confederate artillery and unleashing fire on rebel infantry. 
Troops then counterattack with General Fagan and Colonel McRae, both commanding Arkansas brigades, who charged down, pushing the boys in blue backwards. And wounding Lieutenant Colonel Bertram. Union doesn't give up that easily. More of Orm's men push forward, but well placed volleys from the Arkansas infantry push them back. Fagan and McRae try to push the advantage, but shells from the Union heavy pieces push them back. Houston, not wanting General Heron's sacrifices to go in vain, orders forward his regiments to secure the gains. This is done in a piecemeal fashion, with individual regiments being pounded by full Confederate brigades. Orm's brigade, still vulnerable, is charged again after Houston's mistake was repulsed. The Union cannon explodes to life, buying the reforming brigade valuable time to get ragged fire off and breaking the Confederate assault. Both sides are exhausted. It's just been attack and repulse. But in the distance, cavalry arrives on the scene. Blunt has arrived. The depressed Union spirits rise again, and the triumphal roar of 30 heavy guns is heard, with fire scattering Confederate positions. General Hinman realizes that a new threat has arrived. He orders General Frost to deal with it. Brigades are sent to the Confederate left, opposite of the fresh Federals. Blunt sets forward the borrowed 20th Iowa and 1st Indian Home Guard to attack the Confederates. They are repulsed and countercharged. Once Brigade Commander Colonel Weir also begins advance of the Confederate lines, which is then mirrored. Weir is outnumbered, but his men are better trained and hold off until the Confederates use their longer lines to hit on the flank. The Confederates are charging the main Union line once again. Bang, bam, kaboom. The 30 cannons split apart regiments, cut down companies, breaking the charge apart. Rebels pull back to their lines, defeated, and the Union just stands there. No more counterattacks. The day is late, and Blunt leaves the battlefield. For him, in, this should be part of a multi day battle. But he does not have the supplies to press forward or the men to hold. He has to fall back. As the Rebels leave the field, they hand the Union the victory and desertion becomes epidemic among the rebels. The Union suffered 1,251 casualties, 175 dead, 813 wounded, and 263 missing, to the Confederates 1,317, 164 dead, 817 wounded, and 336 missing. The Union holds northwest Arkansas once again, and the enemy before them is demoralized and broken. On the 8th, we go back to Major General Grant for something more than words. He issues General Order Number 2. Cotton speculators, Jews, and other vagrants, having no honest means of support, except trading upon the miseries of their country, will leave in 24 hours, or they will be sent to duty in the trenches. His anger at cotton traders is not satisfied, as he continues to conflate them with the Jews. His anti-Semitic actions aren't likely to stop here. It isn't just Jewish traders, but the Jewish people that have drawn his ire. On the 9th, Major General Ambrose P. Burnside is ready to move. Probably. At least he is confident enough to write to Henry Halleck saying as much. I think now that I will be more surprised by crossing immediately in our front than any other part of the river. I'm convinced that a large force of the enemy is now concentrated at Port Royal. It's left rushing on Fredericksburg, which we hope to turn. On the 11th, something big, something huge, something that's for a different video. Sickles will also appear in that different video. That's where the week ends, with a Union victory in the West, and Fredericksburg in the East with something. But let's look at Prairie Grove. The Union held against superior numbers, holding their gained territory. After the recent defeats in the East, it's important to remember the victories in the West. The Union has made real gains and held them. The Union has lost time and time again. As Hanukkah ends, this is just a great gift to have. As for those who celebrate Christmas, as for those who celebrate Christmas, let's hope Burnside can do more than just something. I would like to thank you for watching the video, since I assume you didn't just come to the ending for no reason. If you liked the video, please like it. If you want to tell me how much you like it, please comment. And if you want to see more videos to like, please subscribe and watch as I cover this war week by week. You should be seeing on the screen around now a playlist to check out all of 1862. A recommended video, which should be the second opium war, I believe.
and a button to subscribe if the one down is not enough for you. Thank you, and I'll see you next week.